and uh, be mindful that uh, video recordings are not allowed. And please refrain from applause or comments until after the interview. We have Dr. Burr. Uh, and Dr. Burr will give you five minutes to introduce yourself and talk about anything that you'd like the, 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 the board to know and the, the community to know. And then after those five minutes, you don't have to use them all, but you know, you're welcome to. After those five minutes, we'll move into our questions section of the interview. Just like to say uh, good evening to everyone, and I am eternally grateful for the opportunity to uh, sit before uh, the Seven City School Board as well as all of the wonderful community members that we have here. My name is uh, Zacchaeus Bird, or Zacchaeus Bird, or people just call me Zach. Uh, and I have the pleasure of serving as uh, currently as superintendent of Warren County Schools. Uh, I have been a superintendent for the past seven years. I spent five years as superintendent of Connect County Schools, and now, of course, I'm with Warren County Schools. Uh, this is my 23rd year uh, in education, and I'm still excited about education. I'm still excited about teaching and learning. I'm excited about having the opportunity to do all that we can for our wonderful students. Uh, and so, again, uh, the opportunity to sit here and be in the presence of this Seven City Board of Education and the opportunity to come back to a place that I love because I graduated from Concordia College here and I have an everlasting love for the people that I've met at Concordia, uh, to the city, and all of the people uh, that helped uh, a young male that didn't know anything, didn't know anybody here, uh, didn't have any family members here, but for the people that have helped me and have allowed me to be able to graduate from Concordia, I just own an everlasting love and appreciation for it. And so this opportunity to even be considered as a, self, as a superintendent of self city has just truly reignited a fire in me. And so I'm hoping that I will get the opportunity to come back to this place that I love. Uh, I better say it, but I know my wife is in the audience, but I am married uh, to uh, a wonderful young lady by the name of Kimberly Bird. You better get that right, we'll be Okay, I heard, uh, I'll start off uh, with, with the first question. Just let you know we'll be taking notes. and uh, So we're listening, we're just jotting down notes so that we can have it for our reference as we uh, you know, do the score. Uh, Superintendent Board Relationships. What are the methods you will use to keep yourself and the board current on important matters? Well, uh, communication is essential for an effective superintendent and board relationship. Uh, currently, I keep our school board members updated through weekly emails. I also send out uh, group text messages as reminders uh, and also have individual phone calls uh, with the uh, board members. Uh, at this time, the uh, board members of Barton County have it set up to where most uh, communications occurs uh, with the board president, and the board president is able to filter that information down to the other board members. Uh, but in my seven years as superintendent, I have crafted my communication style to whatever style that fits uh, the board members. So my first question uh, to each board member would be to ask for your preferred method of communication, and I will tailor my communication to fit your needs and desires. Okay, the next question comes under curriculum and instructional development. How would you determine the strengths and weaknesses of the instructional program, and how would you go about making changes in the instructional program? Walk us through a specific experience, the strategies, programs, tools you employ, and the resulting data. To evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of this instruction program is that I believe in using data to drive instruction. Uh, this has been the core of my beliefs for the past seven years. Uh, we have to allow data to drive whatever we're doing as a district. And as we look to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of those programs, again, we have to look at the data and see exactly what works. Uh, I would actually uh, meet with uh, teachers. I would actually uh, meet with administrators, and we would sit down and we would actually evaluate each program to see if that program is actually working and if it's actually benefiting our students. 
Now, as we talk about examples of such programs, I can think of one that we're implementing right now in Barber County. Uh, we have an intervention program called iReady, and we're using it uh, for our intermediate school. And I read it basically gives us a predictive uh, assessment or a predictive uh, um, basically to let us know how well the students will actually do on the ACAP. And so we use I read it for this entire year. So when we received our ACAP scores, we actually compared the data and we saw a great alignment uh, to, uh, the, to the ACAP score. So we saw that I read it was actually, it was in fact a predictive assessment to let us know how well our students would do on the ACAP. And so that is an example of a program that has really worked for us. I remember in my previous district uh, when we implemented what I call a fast track graduation program. Uh, the problem was is that I wanted to, I wanted our students to take full advantage of the dual enrollment programs that were being offered by our local schools. And so I knew I had to incentivize them uh, to do that. So what we did is that we implemented a dual me a fast track graduation program that would allow them to graduate a year early. And so they actually took those dual enrollment classes. We allowed those classes to take the place of their high school classes. And so they were actually graduated again a year earlier, both with their high school credits as well as their uh, college credits. And so along with that, we also allow students, of course, with it to be able that if they wanted to, to be in a fast track graduation program to go towards the academic level, they could also go on to the uh, career level as well, where they can actually get jobs and participate and earn money while in high school. And so this program was actually wonderful for our students. And this year, we had our first uh, graduates of the Fast Track Graduation Program, where students actually graduated an entire year early. And they graduated with earning as much as 19 hours. Uh, even again, graduating at the end of their 11th grade year. And so we used that data to drive instruction and in our decision making. Now, an example of a program that didn't necessarily work for us, I can think about our uh, culinary arts program that we implemented. Uh, we thought, and based on the data that we received in the surrounding area, and because we had the Wind Creek Casino close to us, we thought that the culinary arts program would be a great program for our students because, of course, you had Wind Creek and you had all of the wonderful restaurants of Wind Creek. Well, when we implemented that program, despite all of the incentives, despite all the promotions that we put in place, students just were not interested in that program. And so instead of continuing to pump money into the program, we actually canceled that program and we moved to something else. But again, all of this, we had to use data to drive instruction and decision making. Okay. Dr. Burke, what is the role of the superintendent in stimulating the faculty towards professional growth and self-improvement? Outline the types of programs you feel would provide adequate professional growth and development that. Well, the superintendent has to be a cheerleader uh, for the professional development of the school district. We know, of course, what it, that if a system is going to uh, be successful, it actually starts at the top. So the superintendent has to model exactly what he or she actually expects from the employees. And the employees of both of the counties that I have been served in, that I've served as superintendent, can actually tell you that I'm a superintendent that is involved. I, I attend all of our professional development uh, sessions. I'm engaged in all of our professional development sessions, and I stay from the beginning to the end. But not only, of course, whether am I there uh, participating with uh, our employees, but I'm also there leading professional development as, as well. I'm also right there providing side-by-side -side, uh, coaching uh, to our teachers. I'm right there with a servant as a facilitator. I'm the same person whether that would be right there unloading boxes, and I'm the same person that, I, that actually strips and wax our floors for our schools. All of our employees know that I would never ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do uh, myself. And so that is how I actually lead. Whenever it comes to uh, teachers need side-by-side -side coaching, when it comes to teachers that need someone to just come in and model uh, what we're actually asking them to do, teachers know that I'm going to be the first one to do it. Uh, principals are going to also know that I expect the same thing from them. Central office leaders would not be in their office, but they would actually be out there presenting and giving support to our teachers. That's just what I believe. I believe that the superintendent has to model exactly what he or she is actually expecting uh, from the employees. And once you do that, uh, you're going to build a, a cohesive
piece is family, and not only will you have students that are excelling, but you're going to have employees that are excelling as well. Now, as we talk about the different types of professional development that I feel are important, I think that, that yes, that we have to offer professional development that actually addresses every aspect of teaching and learning, that we have to be abreast of the latest research trends in education. But I also believe that first, we got to offer PD that actually addresses the whole child. We have to address the outer shell that I call it of the child. I was actually engaged in two days of PD on last week that actually focused on emotional intelligence and also trauma sensitive uh, intelligence. And in that PD, we were able to recognize that trauma doesn't necessarily always mean that I have watched someone uh, get shot or my home has burned down or I have watched something uh, traumatic. Trauma can be anything that is impeding a child uh, from actually learning, anything where that is prohibiting a child from actually receiving what the teacher is actually trying to give. We have to be able to break down the barriers that actually uh, impede learning. And as I was sitting at PD on last week, I thought about my own traumatic experiences uh, as a child. Growing up as a child uh, in the 80s, I had so many different things with it that were just against me. I had three major things. First, uh, I was very, very dark. As you can see, I'm very, I'm very dark, I'm very black. And so back, so back in the 80s, as we know, it wasn't this popular to be this dark. Uh, and so that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing I had going for is that I was very overweight. Back then, you know, we call it husky. You know, you had your husky pants, you had your face. I guess why I was husky. And then the third thing uh, was that I had a severe speech impediment. I, I had a severe stutter. And so when I went to school, I did everything that I could possibly do to not be noticed. I didn't want anybody calling on me. I didn't want anybody saying anything to me because I didn't want to have to respond. Because even as a child, I had been mocked and I had been ridiculed so much to where my only way of actually staying protected was to just withdraw myself from any and everybody. And so because I wouldn't say anything, I was actually placed in special education. I was placed in special education for six years. Back then, they also called it chapter one. So as the children were actually going out to PD, I was going to my special ed classes. And I had to endure that for six long years. And it wasn't that I didn't know the information, it was just that I couldn't say the information. And the times that I was forced to say something, when I looked at the frustration in my teacher's eyes, and I could see that I'm stuttering, I'm stuttering, I'm trying to get the words out, but now they're frowning and different things such as that, that traumatized me like nothing else. And so finally, in the sixth grade, when I finally asked my mom to force them to test me, I finally found somebody when that would actually build my self-confidence. So not only, so I say this to say, not only is it important for us to address all of the facets of teaching and learning, but we also have to address those children that we have in the district that we would label as being rebellious or one place in alternative school or somewhere else. We have to be able to identify those barriers that are actually impeding their learning. So when we talk about professional development, yes, we want to address everything about teaching and learning, but we're also going to address those barriers that actually impede a child from learning. So I think all of that professional development is important. Given your research um, on some C schools, what innovative strategies and approaches will you employ to increase student achievement, quality of education, facilities, and effective use of funding? What does this plan look like, and um, what will you do to for the outcomes? What will the outcomes look like for some C schools as well? Yes, ma'am. Uh, given my research of several city schools, uh, as well as other districts around the state, I realized that we all face the same dilemma. We are all struggling to address the needs of our ever-changing students. We are living in a society right now to where students are far different uh, than we were when we were in school. And so we are all struggling to embrace this world Take what we can actually take what we can from this world and actually present it to our student in a way that is both rigorous and relevant uh, to their lives. 
And so we're all struggling to do that. So the heavy waste that I would have is that we would have to use the resources that we have. We're living in this world. We have everybody, we have students from this community, we have teachers from this community. So the first thing that I would do is that I would actually meet with the teachers. I would sit down and I would meet with the teachers and I would ask the teachers to think back to the best lesson that they ever presented to their students. And so I would ask them to think about that lesson and to tell me what actually worked. What actually made that lesson so exciting and appealing to students? What type of strategies did they use? I would also ask to meet with the students. I would ask the students to share with me the best lesson that they have ever had. To describe for me the best teacher. Describe that lesson to me. Tell me what you like about the lesson. Tell me what that teacher did that made it so exciting. And so we would actually take that information and we would sit together and we would collaborate and we would work to come up with what we call Selma Education's Plan for Success. Selma Education Students' Plan for Success. <coughs> And that plan, again, it will be made up of all of the information that we have gleaned from the teachers, all the information that we have gleaned from the students. We have come up with best practices. We have come up with the tools, the strategies, and the resources that we need to make sure that we are addressing the needs of several city students, not the needs of Montgomery County, not the needs of uh, Mobile, but the needs of the students here in Selma City. And so we would take that information and we would come up with that plan. And because we know that student success is going to be measured based on the state's the state's assessment system, we will make sure that we pull the standards from the state's assessment system and we will make sure that we introduce those standards to our students. We will make sure that we train our teachers on the best practices of actually teaching those standards and we will make sure that we have a monitor to set up to where we can frequently inspect what we expect. And so if we continue to inspect what we expect and what I will do is put in place what I call district quality assessments, DQAs, it would allow us to be able to evaluate how well our teachers are teaching and how well our students are learning. And if we do it every quarter, it allows us to be able to see the standards that they actually know and the standards that they don't know. And so for the standards that they don't know, it would be able to go back and actually reteach those standards, making sure that when it comes time for the state assessment, all of our students will know all of the standards, they will have exposed to all of the standards, and they will know how to be proficient on those standards. So that would actually address uh, student achievement and quality of education. 
when it comes to uh, facilities, the top three priorities for our facilities would be, of course, the facility inspections. I would work with, with our maintenance supervisor, and we would actually uh, contract, uh, and we would actually conduct uh, evaluations of our uh, facilities uh, with an outside agency. So we would conduct facility inspections. We would take that information and make sure, of course, that we are providing maintenance on a schedule that we can actually uh, afford. So we have facility, facility inspections, facility maintenance, and then of course we would do what uh, the old grandma or grandpa saying is that we would make sure what, that we're always hoping for the best, but we're going to plan for the worst. And so when it comes to facilities, we're going to make sure that we actually work with the CSFO and our budget team to make sure that we're always putting money to the side to make sure that we are addressing those things that we know that are going to be ever that they're going to be reoccurring things such as HVAC, uh, such as plumbing, such as different things, and such as that. So we have to make sure, of course, whether that we're providing uh, for some facility inspections, facility maintenance, and making sure, of course, that we're doing what we can do to make sure that we keep our buildings up and running, and making sure, of course, whether that we don't have anything that would impact the budget long term. And so the best way to do that, of course, is through uh, frequent facility inspections uh, and maintenance. And of course, and as we talk about the last one, in regards to funding, making sure, of course, whether that we are always identifying uh, possible ways to increase our funding. So we have to make sure that we are frequently monitoring uh, our funding. The second thing is that we have to make sure that we are communicating our funding to the board members and, of course, to department heads and to principals, making sure that everyone is aware of the funding that we have, making sure that we're giving constant updates so we're not worried about having to spend a big amount of money at the end for fear of actually losing that money. And then of course the third thing would be always, always looking for ways to reduce expenditures and increase our revenues.
why have these funds, these funds been spent in this amount of time? And we're going to have honest, honest discussions about what and how can these funds be spent. You have an ACIP, you have told us that you're going to plan for these funds in these ways, and so we're going to constantly monitor uh, the use of these funds, and that's going to prevent us from having to all of a sudden at the end of the year spend these funds uh, on programs that we don't need, that is a waste of money, and that is a simply a replication of something that we already have. And so we'll make sure that the first thing that we do is conduct the program audit to reduce the funds, to reduce the programs that we have. And of course, we will have frequent updates and good monitoring budget to make sure that we're not in this position again. Um, my next question is, is for you. Chick-fil-A mindset to where you want to stop what you're doing and 
if you want to be a service to the employees that actually dedicate so much to our students. So and I just believe in valuing our employees and as well finding any possible way that we can to show our appreciation. And at this time, uh, money seems to be a good reason to ask that money seems to be a good reason to, uh, that they will come, but it's going to be the customer service and the way we value them that will make them stay. provisions and improvements today in order to get there. 
So again, Sarah has accomplished some wonderful things, and I can go on and on and on about what this place has done for me. But I, I know that we still have many bridges to cross, and we can get there if we work together. Uh, when I was appointed superintendent in Connecticut County, uh, 
uh, we actually increased enrollment by over 600 students within uh, three years uh, through a virtual program that we actually had in Connecticut County. And so that worked wonders uh, for us. And so we were able to maintain uh, that, that increase in enrollment. Uh, just this past year in Barber County, uh, it would actually it was noted uh, in the Montgomery Advertisers and on AL.com that of the 138 school districts that we have in the state, 99 of those districts actually lost students, that their enrollment actually decreased significantly. And of those 99 was seven city schools. I think the Silver City Schools lost probably about 378 students and about 21 teacher units. Uh, that was actually, that is, that is astounding. Uh, that's astounding. Silver City School is among the top of the districts that have actually lost a significant portion of our students. So in order to uh, prevent that from happening again, of course, I will actually expand on the virtual program uh, that Silver City has. Uh, if it's not being allowed, uh, if, if statewide enrollment is not being allowed, I will actually uh, uh, talk to the board and ask for the reason why that we may want to consider uh, opening it up to be a statewide. Uh, but also what I would do is that just like I would do exactly what we did in Barber County because of those 99 districts that actually lost students and all those sales here was one of them, Barber County wasn't. For the first time in 10 years, Barber County has not had a decrease in enrollment. As a matter of fact, our enrollment increased by over 10%. And when we polled our parents and we asked them uh, why they were actually bringing their students back, the overwhelming majority of the parents stated whether that they were satisfied with the improvements that Barber County has actually made within the past year. So an improvements whether that we have made over the past year, of course, what they have been in regards to academic achievement, but there have also been in regards to student support and customer service. Again, we treat our parents just like we need them and they don't need us. So we make sure that whenever they call, whenever they have a question about anything, we make sure that we are right there to provide support. Uh, if our parents are having issues with anything, we actually go to their houses. Uh, we make sure that we actually have a support system in line for our students. If our students aren't showing up, we're actually calling. If our students need uh, clothing, we're right there to purchase it for them. Uh, we make sure that report cards are actually sent home on time. We make sure that uh, parents uh, find it easy to set up appointments. Uh, teachers, we make sure that we address every aspect of customer service. Again, it is that Chick-fil-A mindset. We realize whether that in order for us to have jobs, we need students. In order for us to have students, we have to have parents. And so we treat them like that. And so this is so that is what we have done and we have increased the role of over 10%. But also uh, we have been able to do what we're doing in Barber County, we have been able to do it better than our neighboring districts. And so for the first time, Barber County has not lost students. Barber County has actually gained students and we gained over 10 percent. So that's what we would that's that's what I would propose that we actually do here in Silver City, is that we would look for ways to make sure that we that we can increase enrollment. We would look for ways to provide great customer service to our parents and students. We would look for ways to make sure that the program that we actually expand all of the programs that we have. We want to make sure that what we're doing here in Silver City, that we're doing it better than our uh, than our neighbor. Yes, ma'am, we have a CSFO in place, we have a finance department in place, but ultimately the responsibility falls on the superintendent to ensure that we have physical management uh, for the people that we actually serve. Uh, as superintendent, of course, what that budget and the finance has been, uh, has always had to be a priority of mine because I have been superintendent of very poor districts and superintendents both uh, that were in financial distress whenever I arrived. Uh, and it's widely known that uh, Barber County uh, two years ago was in the worst financial condition uh, of the state at that time. And I don't say that, uh, loosely, I don't say that uh, as a way of actually praying about it, but this was actually known because it was actually published in the papers. Uh, but when I arrived at uh, the system, when I arrived, of course, at the system, when I went to the bank, uh, the bank was informing me of the, uh, the balance checks for the district. And we were also in jeopardy of not being able to meet the 
was payroll. Uh, and so I had to immediately go in and declare a reduction in force. Uh, none of the local banks would actually give us a loan. I was, our credit rating was, uh, was bad. And so I had to go to the State Department and actually ask for a loan so that we could actually make it open as payroll. And so we worked through those issues, and within a year, uh, we were able to turn around our finances. And within that year, uh, for the first time, we had a one black operating reserve. Uh, now we're getting ready to end our second year uh, with a two black operating reserve. And again, when that was done, because we had to go in and we had to change uh, funding codes, we actually had to change expenditures, uh, we had to decrease expen expenditures. Again, all of that was done. Uh, and it was done successfully uh, due to the experience with it that I have had in actually dealing with financial distress school systems, I should say. Uh, and so we have been able to turn it around successfully. But again, uh, the ultimate responsibility that falls on the superintendent to ensure physical management of school district. Insurance, 
we have cars, we're able to take care of our families. Our students, they deserve the same opportunities. We have to be about making sure that we are preparing the next generation to be able to live and thrive in this world. So in order to build a better and cohesive self city schools, we have to continually remind our students, we remind our employees that if it's about me, mine, and I, we're not concerned about that. That has been replaced with he, she, and them. It's all about our students and what we can actually do for our students. Can you, can you
attained those standards that have not been mastered. And so if we are actually following a pacing guide and we're actually making sure that we have formal assessments in place, we also have our district assessments in place, we're able to target those students that have not mastered those standards and we would have time to go back and actually teach those standards. We would have time to address the needs of those students that have not mastered those standards. So it gives us time to make sure that we have interventions in place, to make sure that by the time the state assessment comes around, that we have actually identified those students that, are, that have not mastered the standards, that we have actually identified those standards that most of the students are having problems with, and we have time to go back and actually teach them. So if we do that, this would actually ensure that we have actually provided our students with all that they need to be successful on the state assessment, and which will allow us to close the achievement gap. Dr. Berger, that was the last of the questions. I just have a few closing questions for you. Uh, what do you think has been your most outstanding contribution to your present or most recent school system? Yes, sir. What I think has been the most outstanding achievement for Barber County Schools, and as I think about it, I am I'm thankful and I'm humble for the successes that we have been able to make. Uh, I didn't know anything about Barber County uh, after I left uh, Connecticut County, uh, but I was actually asked uh, by some officials to actually to go to Barber County and actually address the needs uh, that the district had. Uh, and the district had a lot of needs. The district was in trouble, the district was in the midst of state takeover, uh, and so the district had a lot of issues. But most importantly, the district had a lot of uh, human capital issues, the district had a lot of financial issues, the district was just basically, uh, it, was, it was in bad shape. Uh, and so after a year of actually going in and actually working hard and actually Turning the, district, turning the district around and actually achieving some things that many people have said that would never happen, uh, it was a great accomplishment for me. And as we get ready to end uh, our year two, I had the opportunity to actually attend a state meeting uh, just a few months ago. And the superintendent actually uh, stood up and recognized Barber County as being the most improved district uh, in the state of Alabama. And so that was quite a humbling experience. Uh, it was an exciting experience, and so I, that would probably go down probably as probably the most rewarding experience that, that I've had as a leader uh, in, in my career. Well, do you have any questions that you would like to ask the board? Uh, no, sir, uh, I don't have any questions. Uh, I, I think for that, that, that uh, I've already done all my research about it. So. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I, I'm just humbled and I'm just thankful uh, for the opportunity to appear for you all in front of you all. And I thank you all so much for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now those goodies on the desk are for you. Whatever for, for your wife, I know I have one. <laughs>